brown or these two pins that it gets it off of. And then it had this IMP, which uh, describes the impedance. Sorry. describes the impedance of the, uh, of the user circuit. Um, and that's important because it, you can set up all sorts of timing parameters and you can make analog conversions faster or slower depending on what that impedance is. Um, and uh, this is sort of the first example of a semantic model because we're putting an equivalent circuit in place for the user circuit and we're saying it has this impedance. Um, the consequences of that in terms of how the analog conversion is carried out are quite complicated, but that's my job, so you don't have to deal with that. All you have to do is advise the microcontroller what impedance to expect on that pin. Um, here's some, a couple of basic uh, <coughs> examples of little devices built on a micro OSC. This is an electronic kalimba. Uh, you push down the stick and it squeezes a little thing which changes resistance. Here's this thing called the, the Tableau. It has a the stretchy conductive fabric. Um, and depending on how far, and, and these are also conductive strips. I think of Velostat on an inverted IKEA bowl. Um, <laughs> you put your hand down somewhere and you make, it closes the circuit and uh, the distance from the bowl is a, a variable resistance. Okay. So these are both resistive sensors. Um, and it turns out that you basically you can't measure a resistance directly. Um, you have to measure the voltage that results from a ratio of that unknown resistance to another known resistance. Okay, and that circuit is called the pull up or the pull down. Um, here's the unknown part, and here's a known resistance, um, and here's the point where you measure, which uh, is sort of a balance that gets created between these two uh, things. So that's a pull down, pull up just goes the other way with uh, you sort of switch the sides. This is a really common circuit. Um, so one thing we're looking at is basically saying, well, why not just inform the microcontroller that you're looking at a pull up or a pull down circuit um, and what the reference value is? Because in fact, the output of this circuit is highly nonlinear, um, and I wrote a little blog entry about this. Uh, basically, you can see that you get this sort of curve shape um, as the uh, the unknown resistance varies, um, and if you don't, then you can put it into a formula and make that into a straight line, and then you have a nice linear sensor, uh, and we can do that directly with microcontroller. Uh, and by the way, I'll, it, I'll put a link to this on the on the Stein blog or whatever. But there's also a formula here for calculating the optimal pull-up resistor in case you want to do that. Um, so that's useful. Uh, so the way we implement that on the microcontroller is we just add another message here, which is uh, our reference basically tells you what the reference um, resistance is, and then it's going to compute um, that linearization formula for you. Uh, and, and basically, you do something like this. You say uh, the thing connected to pin A0 has an impedance of 20K, and it has a pull-up resistance of 10. All right, so now here's the next example. Um, this is this crazy thing. Um, that we built. Uh, this is an electronic cello. We built this for uh, Francis Marie Litti, who's here today. You can ask her more questions about it. Um, basically, the way this works is there's uh, touch strips here on the front. There's six of them. There's six more on the back. Um, and in these rods uh, sense the rate of turn when you bow it using a small motor. And it also senses pressure using a, a resistive uh, pressure sensor in the, located underneath the bearing at the bottom here. There's also an infrared distance. 
This whole thing, by the way, is powered by one of those spark fun bit whackers, which is right here. So it's quite a lot of sensors. And there's multiplexing chips being used to talk to all of them. So I'm going to show you what happens when I plug that in. Device connected. Uh, I send it some commands to configure it. And um, this should give some indication of data happening. So that's it. Um, but what you can see is that, uh, <laughs> that's as far as I'll go. Um, <laughs> What you can see here is, is I'm actually getting about a thousand, close to a thousand messages per second. Um, and by the time all that stuff gets multiplexed down, I'm actually able to read each one of those strips at about 70 times per second. So that's not bad for a $25 microcontroller uh, in terms of the hardware performance. And the, is the demultiplexing done locally? Or? Uh, the demultiplexing is done on the host computer. Okay. Um, basically, you just look at the state of the uh, multiplex driver and figure out which channel it's connected to. Um, part of the reason that that's possible is because to achieve that sort of rate of throughput on the data is uh, because of that impedance setting. There's a lot of op amps being used, so these are all low impedance inputs. Um, so I'm able to set the impedance and advise it that you know it's really only like 100 ohms resistance. Um, on those channels, and so it can do those conversions quicker. Um, and it uses that to set up the, the conversion time. Um, so here's how the multiplex driver works. Basically, you have some channels, and they sort of count in binary from 0 to uh, 12 on, on this thing. And, and the corresponding and the input channels that go through that multiplex are jumped between the two different values. Or I, I for simplicity, we're just using two here. Um, how do you actually configure that in OSC messages? Uh, basically, you send here's these four pins are going to be the multiplex drivers, and you send this message that looks sort of like a funny little formula. Uh, so it says set the value of that pin to be this formula, which is sort of related to this like internal ticking mechanism. So basically, it's sort of like mod 12, bitwise and, and when with one, and when that's true your state is high, otherwise it's low. Um, and this, so these this little four messages implement a multiplex driver. Um, here's where I set the impedance to tell it it's low impedance. Um, and then I also just switch off other channels that are not in use, because that helps with the speed, because you can make the packet smaller. And then I tell it to use this special extra compact format um, for the messages. And that's how we get up to about 1,000 messages per second. Um, what actually happens in practice with the multiplex driver is that uh, every time you switch to a new channel, there's this sort of switching capacitance that causes a delay um, in the uh, before it sort of settles at the new voltage. So what we would actually like to do is, is not perform that analog conversion right away, but sort of wait for a while. Um, and how long we can wait has to, it depends on the capacitance. So we're kind of thinking about how to model this in circuit semantics. But probably we're going to have some sort of message that advises it about this, the capacitance of that channel or how quickly it reacts. And, that, and then it'll sort of tune when the conversion happens. Uh, here's another circuit. Here's another little application. Um, this is a, an infrared camera. Um, here's a three axis accelerometer, and an ultrasound rangefinder at the front. Um, and there's a micro OSC board over here. Um, so this I put up here just to talk about the how the rangefinder works. Um, this uses a pulse echo type protocol. So on the pulse line, you send on off, then you wait, and then you get a, another blip, which corresponds to the uh, time delay for that ultrasound wave to propagate and return. Uh, so, so basically, the way this sensor works is by precisely measuring this time. Uh, 
So how do we do that succinctly in sort of micro OSC world? Well, basically, you send 0, 1, 0 on your pulse line, and then you wait for a while, and then it's 0, 0, 0, and then suddenly it's 1. Um, and then you have to go back all the way back to the thing where I was talking about the OSC bundles and the real-time flock. Because as soon as this goes to 1, uh, you go and peel off the timestamp information from that bundle, and that will tell you exactly when that interrupt occurred. Um, so basically, this is a, a very uh, general way to implement any kind of um, precise timing on digital I.O. lines, um, and it uses the hardware features of the microcontroller to uh, detect when these interrupts occur, but um, it doesn't require uh, special programming in the microcontroller to handle that case because the sort of the OSC interface takes care of that for you. Um, here's another circuit. This is affectionately called the pogo stick, and this is a prototype for the um, for the cello, which is over there, and it's a one-string version. So uh, this thing on the top is a touch sensor that sees two points. Here's a demo, and it also sees pressure cells. So you can see he's running his finger back and forth. Now he's got two fingers on it, and it sees both fingers. Um, and I think it'll change color when he tweaks the pressure, which he's doing now. Okay. And that's one of the, these FSR interlink um, strips, but we've modified it. Um, I'll show you how. So here's the circuit that describes what's going on there. Um, there are uh, there's two resistances associated with the distance from uh, either end. Um, there's another variable resistance associated with the pressure where you're pushing down. Um, then there's a pull up on this end, another pull up on this end of one mega ohm each. And then uh, there's a pull down of 10K across the pressure. Um, but the real reason this works is because this is connected to a microcontroller pin. And there, you can switch between the pin states. So one of the states is connected to ground. Another state is um, an input state. So normally it's connected to ground. And when it's connected to ground, you measure these distances. And when it's floating, this becomes a pull, down, uh, pull up. Uh, resistive divider, and you measure this pressure. So that's how you can get pressure and two distances out of one of those strips, which normally only give you pressure by the way. Um, has, here's how you set that up in OSC messages. Basically, you sort of advise the pins of what the impedance is to expect and what their uh, reference resistors are for the pull up. Um, and then you set up this switching logic. Uh, for that pin, and now we're switching the direction on this sort of schedule, where it becomes an input, becomes an output. Um, here's another example. I'm going to show you a video of that. This device is a concept of an interface for an MP3 player. It consists of an LCD screen for informational display, well as a line of LEDs, which has a bidirectional function, both as a sensor for setting volume and also as an indicator for the current volume of music. Inside the box, there is essentially a CUI running micro OSC and some LEDs under wires. Now, the way this LED strip works is a technique called bidirectional LED sensing. Uh, in bidirectional LED sensing, the two pins of the LED are both connected to a microcontroller and sequentially move through three different states. One, driving the LED so that it is either on or off. Uh, two, reverse biasing the LED, which charges its 
internal capacitance. And the third state, it allows that capacitor to discharge, and I use the uh, analog input to estimate the rate of discharge, which um, increases when the finger shadows the LED. So because this relies on the ambient light level, I've been letting it calibrate for a while. I will disable the calibration and demonstrate setting the volume. Here I will move my finger along the strip, and you can see the lights follow my finger. Now we've set the volume to the maximum. I'll set it to something else in between. Now when I start the music, those lights will be used as an indicator for the current level of music. So it's basically a V meter now. While the music is playing, I can adjust the volume just by running my finger across this So how that works in, this is what it looks like on an oscilloscope uh, for one LED. Um, this first stage is whether you want the LED on or off. So here it's on, and this other one it's off. Uh, then you reverse bias it to charge up its capacitance, and then you let it discharge. And, and that tells you how much light is falling on it, because it's basically becomes a five, uh, sort of photodiode. Um, so the way you configure that in the micro OSC syntax is that first you set up this uh, pin switching logic on one of the pins, the LED, uh, which <coughs> switches between um, uh, a low state, a high state, and then an input. So it goes low, high, in, low, high, in, etc. Um, then when you want an output, you you do another sort of scheduled transition um, on this other pin using this other formula. And then to turn it off, you just say zero on that pin, and then it's only a light sensor. Um, and one of the other things I'm sort of looking at as a topic of reference or future research is how to is a mode that's set up as specifically for sensing this sort of charge-discharge thing, because that's actually a fairly common uh, design pattern in lots of sensors, where you, you charge something up and then you discharge it and see how fast it goes. Um, so that's how you configure that sensor in micro SC. Um, here's another one. This is a, a multi-touch pad. I have a little video demo of this as well. This sensor interface is a pressure sensing pad that sees pressure at 192 discrete locations on its surface. It's implemented with a piezo resistant fabric uh, and so pad. conductive electric tape. The tape on the top surface travels one way and on the bottom surface travels along the other dimension. Now, the ends of these pieces of tape are connected to wires which go to a ribbon cable, and the ribbon cable plugs into this circuit which uses the uh, vertical grounding technique uh, with uh, four quad hopping amps and a microcontroller. Now, the microcontroller is running micro OSC, and program is activated, each one of these vertical strips becomes a
drive line, which uh, using a multiplex driver sequentially scans along the surface of the pad, generating a image of the force distributed across the surface of this fabric. Now, basically to play it, you just sort of push on different spots and activate those regions. At this point, I have to disable the video since my computer can't run the video patch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> screen capture of the jitter video feed. <laughs> but it just couldn't handle it all. Here's the patch showing the data. I will now enable the multiplex driver. The pad has a significant amount of hysteresis that we don't fully understand. Yet. So for that reason, there's some problems in this. Right? There's a filter being <coughs> filter. Essentially, make it a sort right, of so a little bit. So basically, you kind of push on it, and it makes different sounds. All right. So that's that. Um, so, so here's the pad. Um, here's basically a circuit that describes how it works. Um, uh, there's a um, there's a virtual ground that's established at the halfway point, 2.5 volts out of the five total. Um, there's a sort of complicated thing with diodes and switching where this goes between high and tri-state, and that implements this drive line that switches between 2.5 and, and 5 volts uh, for all these 16 drive lines. And there's actually four in this diagram. Uh, so basically, each one of these is connected to a microcontroller pin that goes through these states sequentially. And so first this one's activated, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. And then the output all goes to these op amps that have this virtual ground thing. And then the, and the output of the op amp goes to the analog input. So how do you set that up in terms of the micro OSC messages? Um, basically, uh, using this same sort of concept that a lot of these other sensors circuits have used already. Um, you set up some kind of schedule for switching the, uh, the high-low state of all these drive lines, as well as their direction, where they, either they float or they drive. Um, and then you say, well, we're using op amps, and we want a lot of data really fast. So these are all low impedance, by the way. And also, let's do ratio metric. Um, conversions relative to this, uh, um, treat this as the as the V plus when we're doing all these conversions. So that happens right here. We say VP is on AN3. Um, that's that. Uh, there's, there's also some other sort of OSC spaces for the other hardware modules. Um, they're all there, PWM, as well as you can get sort of direct access to the EEPROM. Uh, the budget digital protocols that are implemented, um, and to, basically to use like a TTL serial, you sort of say what baud rate you want, and then you say transmit some data, and you get the messages when data is received. Um, and it's about that complicated for any other SPI or I squared C device. Um, here's some examples of different TTL serial devices that I've used with micro OSC. Um, Using it is about this complicated in terms of the messages that you send. Uh, here's some 